Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. On today's video, we're gonna be doing a little bit of a test and try. And what we're gonna be looking at is, well, this ST506 slash MFM hard drive here and this controller that is attached to it. And the label just fell off there. Who makes this hard drive? It looks like it's a Tandon TM252. I don't know what size it is. I don't know if this thing even works. I don't, any, I don't know anything about this stuff. But the fact is this 8-bit controller here is paired with this drive. Well, I got it in this paired configuration with these cables. So I think, uh, I think the first thing to do is let's see if this MFM type drive even works. And if it does spin up and seems to work, maybe with this card, we can actually read what's on this thing. I'm assuming this came out of like an IBM XT or some other PC clone. So maybe there's some interesting stuff on here. If, uh, well, the drive, we can get it working and it's not readable, it may need a low-level format. And we can try doing that with this XT card here, or I could try using a 16-bit card, which will obviously give us some more performance if I pair it with a faster computer, like I have a 46 test bench sitting right here. If we take a look at the drive here, I mean, I don't know, there's not a whole lot to say about it other than, um, well, it's got these drive rails on the side here, so this clearly came out of some computer that used these rails. Now, it looks a little corroded. Oh. You know what? These are hard to get out. And uh, it's the beveled screws when there's corrosion. You see this corrosion right here and there's this on the top of the drive here. Sometimes those can be pretty difficult to come out because the beveled nature can make them kind of get fused in there and you can easily strip those. So I'm gonna use my impact driver here by Ryobi. And a few people have asked me about this thing because it's sort of been sitting around in the back of the bench here. Um, what is this thing here? PSB ID01. It's a brushless motor. I don't know. Um, I use, I have some lawn equipment that uses these larger four amp hour batteries. So I already had these. So I bought just the tool only. And um, well, it works with the batteries, which is perfect. And yeah, this is an impact driver. What an impact driver is, is it's essentially like a powerful screwdriver, but it has this hammer assembly in the front here. So when you run at normal speeds, it just is like a electric or powerful electric screwdriver. But when it bottoms out or it can't turn the bit anymore, what happens is it starts hammering on this entire shaft here, which can really break free screws and stuff and um, get them out or get them in. If you're screwing into wood, you don't have to drill a hole. Ultimately, I think I'm not using the right um, adapter here. You should have something that has a little like flexible part that enables it to flex a little bit and does a better job at getting stuff out, tough screws. This has worked well, well, fine for me, this DeWalt thing, I just had this. So anyways, I'm gonna try on here, uh, make sure it's in reverse, and it is. And obviously it has a variable speed thing, so I won't like slam it with full power here. Let's just see if this comes out. Oh, okay, that just came out anyways. <laughs> there was nothing there to, it wasn't, it wasn't actually stuck. Let's get them all out. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't really need this in the end. I just have to say that I have really found that if the screw is stuck, that this thing is awesome for getting things out. That hammering action just sort of frees it up without chewing the screw up. Oh, I got one little hammer out of it there. Kind of makes a loud clunk sound. Okay. So these rails are pretty chunky, aren't they? Just like solid pieces of aluminum here. I don't know what system these are from, but... um. <laughs> They're kind, of, they're kind of badass, aren't they? Very interesting. Okay, so we can take a look at the drive here. It looks like no one has ever been inside. Is the rubber still soft there? Yes, it is. It's still squishy a little bit. We do have a little corrosion there. There's a little bit of there as well. That's a bad sign to me because if this thing were it was in a damp environment, the whole spindle assembly might be frozen and whatnot. Oh, okay, well, <laughs> it's not frozen. That turns okay. So that's cool. Um, sometimes the heads can get fused onto the platter and that is not the case. This thing seems to be turning without any issue. It does have a front panel here. It doesn't say anything on it. It's just got the red LED power connection, standard Molex, but it does have a wire harness. And then is this, ah, that's unusual. It's a pin header. So normally it's a card edge type connector on these hard drives. And this one is not that. I didn't even see which way I just took that off. No, the, the, the stripe must have been away like this, right? Right? Oh boy, I might have to review the footage to be honest. Let me go do that really quickly. Footage reviewed, yes, the uh, stripe was the same direction. Often the stripe on most devices actually faces the power connector. That seems like a convention that a lot of things use, but on this drive, obviously that's not the case. Now, sometimes you can tell which is pin one because the pad for pin one will be square. 
but all of these pads are square. <laughs> so that doesn't help us at all. And you might often have some mark that says pin one. You can see here, there's a pin one, or that's for a jumper one, I guess. There is no marking at all, which is pin one anywhere on this drive. It might be on the top side, but pretty unfriendly there, Tandem, pretty unfriendly. Now take a look at the controller. It does have a pin one, so these cables are connected that way. And this one here, same thing, there's the pin one. So this cable right here, this small one, this is for the data itself. It uses differential signaling, I think running at maybe five megabits that runs over this cable. And this is like very similar to a floppy drive, to be honest, that's a 34 pin connector. And this essentially is moving the heads back and forth. It steps them with different directions and stuff like that. It can tell if the drive is ready and has drive select stuff. But yeah, this is the data itself. Unlike a floppy drive, which just has the data coming over this cable, the pinout is slightly different, but then they move the data over to here and the end has several wires with ground cables. But indeed, when this ST506 format was developed, which I guess was Seagate, hence the ST, I think they just derived it from the floppy drive interface and that's why it's so similar. But this controller card on the other hand, if we zoom out a little bit here, it's a Western Digital affair, at least the chipset is. Uh, yep, Western Digital 1984, all rights reserved. And we have a, a chipset from Western Digital and some kind of a microcontroller there, or probably an Intel 8051 style chip. We zoom in a little bit. Uh, what does that say? 8749, that is of that family, that 8751 family. So yeah, this is an Intel microcontroller. So instead of using a processor of some kind, it's using this. It's still an 8-bit microcontroller, which is basically like an 8-bit processor. We got a ROM chip, and that's because the 8-bit nature of this card means that it goes into an IBM XT. The original IBM XT did not natively support hard drives, so any adapter that you plug into an XT machine needs to have its own BIOS ROM, which is then called by the main system BIOS to enable the hard drive act, um, capabilities of the system. 16-bit systems, like the IBM PC5170 and later, and all the clones, the BIOS itself supports the hard drive directly. So those hard drive controllers, which I can actually grab, I have one right here. This is a 16-bit controller. Notice it's very similar, Western Digital as well, but it does not have a BIOS chip on here at all, even though um, it looks like it maybe does here, but this is not a BIOS chip. The system BIOS itself is what talks directly to the controller car, uh, chips here, which then controls the hard drive. And the funny thing is, this card here is, well, a miniaturized version of the original 5170 hard drive controller card that sort of established the standard. And if you can believe it, IDE hard drives, and not just them, but these compact flash cards here, which is just like an IDE hard drive miniaturized into a card, implements the same command set that this card uses right here, which is a clone of the original 5170 card. So yeah, while there's a bunch of extensions and ultra DMA and all that kind of stuff that came later, the original base command set that this card uses and the original 5170 card uses, it's what's still inside of these compact flash cards and IDE hard drives, and I bet even SATA drives, I think. Not sure about the SATA drives, but at least these. And that is why you can take one of these and stick this with an IDE adapter into a 5170, and it works. Well, with a, a modded BIOS, it works. That's because the commands are the same all the BIOS types and stuff in there with the heads and cylinders and the way it communicates to this by moving the heads around and reading sectors, it's all freaking the same. So it's just kind of interesting that lineage. But what's not the same is the way that this card works with its own BIOS. Because these had BIOSes on them, that means that the commands that were used by these chips, they could be whatever they wanted because the BIOS on here is what tells the computer how to interface to this, like how to read a sector and what commands to use with the chips that are on here. What that essentially means is that not only are the commands different, but then the way that it interfaces to the drive, well, the, the interface, the physical interface is the same, but the sector information that's written onto the drive, the actual data can be encoded in a different way. It can be written in a different structure. Like it's generally I found not compatible. And that means that if this driver were working and formatted with this card, we couldn't unplug these cables and then plug it into this card here, move that combat flash out of the way, plug it into here and have it work. The physical connection from this to the hard drive is will work, but the data that's on the hard drive is probably not compatible. So when you try to read the hard drive, it won't work. 
what you would have to do is just re-low level format the hard drive, which is a command that this thing will do, and it will write down a new structure on the drive, and then it will be able to read it and work perfectly. That's if the drive is working, of course. But if you take the drive and unplug it from here and plug it back into this card, it's not gonna work again. So if you have a hard drive that you wanna to try to re retrieve data off of, and it is an 8-bit card like this, do not take these apart. Keep it, to get, you know, keep it paired together. I mean, the cables don't matter. You could use different cables. Although these are weird cables because uh, as I mentioned, normally it's edge, it's edge connectors and not these pin headers. But you could just use a floppy cable for this with a straight through and I guess make one of those. Anyways, point being, 8-bit card, Hard drive, you gotta keep them together, even from one 8-bit card to another. There's a good chance that not compatible, like it won't be able to, uh, it won't be able to read the hard drives. So you really, if you're gonna try to recover data, I really do recommend just keeping the card here with, with the drive. And that's what we're gonna do today. Now, I'm no expert and when it comes to these hard drives and like what's going on with like the magnetic data and coercion of the disk and all this, that, and the other thing. But what I have found with these hard drives is that over time, the magnetic flux that's written onto here can actually, I don't know if it's like fading or what, what the deal is exactly, but it seems that it does fade over time. And what that means is that even with this combo right here, if this drive spins up and does work, it doesn't mean we can necessarily read the data or we might be able to read some of it, but then it will have a bunch of read errors and things like that. And it seems to be, well, I, I, as far as I'm aware, it seems like the magnetic flux has actually faded a little bit. And generally, if the drive is kind of working, I've been able to revive hard drives by, well, either doing one of two things, re-low-leveling re -low leveling the drive, which writes down a new kind of sector map structure onto the disk and rejuvenates that magnetic flux. So it like writes down a fresh magnetic signal that's stronger, and then the drive actually just works fine after that. Like you're able to read it back without any issue. Or you use a program like SpinWrite, which essentially allows you to re-low level the hard drive without erasing it. The way it works is it reads back one sector or one track, I guess. It tries to get as much data, like read it as correctly as possible. And then it re-low level formats just that one track and so it's writing down fresh magnetic information onto that track and it goes through the entire disk and that process can take hours or you know a whole day or whatever to thoroughly read and then write back the entire data. But what that has the side effect of doing is taking a disk that's kind of marginal and then making it work again. And um, I've definitely been able to recover multiple of these types of drives using that method. It just seems that rewriting the magnetic signal onto the disk is all that's necessary to make it work again. So that might be what we're gonna to need to do with this. But I think I'm really getting ahead of myself here because one of the biggest problems with these drives is not the fading magnetic information on the disk. It's that the physical disk itself, the drive itself has failed or is, is failing. And that's really because as far as I'm aware, the design lifetime of these types of drives, if you go look up the data sheets for them, was only five years, something like that. And you know, this drive is from the 80s, right? So it's way older than five years. Not to mention, if you have corrosion like this one, or it was a machine that was stored in an attic or in a hostile environment, that is far worse for the mechanics than if it was stored in like a nice climate controlled environment its whole life. What's pretty amazing, to be honest, is that with these old hard drives, like this one's from the company Tandon. Tandon doesn't exist anymore. I don't know what happened to them. They probably got bought by someone and then that company got bought by someone. And all we're left with right now is what, like Western Digital, Seagate, and I don't even know, Hitachi? No, that's Western Digital now. Samsung, maybe? Like, there's only a handful of companies making spinning disks anymore. And there was a whole lot of consolidation over the years. But back in the 80s and the early days, there were like 30 hard drive manufacturers making hard drives. And many of them only lasted for just a handful of years before they went under and then their assets got bought up by one of the other manufacturers. And because of that, you know, these companies were sort of new to the game of making hard drives. Sometimes the quality was very variable and you have some drives that just seem to always work even if they're 40 years old. And then you have other ones that really, um, well, they failed a long time ago and they failed in mass. And even Seagate, which was making drives from back in the day, a lot of their drives are dead now as well. And I know I've done videos, I think on the second channel where, or maybe the main channel, I tested out a bunch of drives and you know, it's, it's kind of hit and miss uh, the way they actually work. Now, looking at this drive just one more time here, just before we actually power it up, and I know I've talked a lot here, look at the way the, <laughs> the lid is attached on this. Often they're screwed down. This uses these like clamps here, which I don't know. I don't know if I've seen that before, but you see how it's clamped on to hold this down? 
Now there is a rubber seal that goes all the way around here. And I'm assuming when they put these clamps on, there was a special tool to do that, or maybe they just sort of clip into place. But that means if this drive is not working, then it might be a bit of a trick to get these off and open the drive and then try to get it closed again. Also, you'll notice here it's using a stepper motor for moving the head assembly. So the disc is right here and there's gonna be a couple different platters in there probably. And then the head stuff is over here. So with the stepper motor, there's gonna be a metal band or, or a rack and pinion or something underneath here that is moving that head around. Now these stepper motors are, well, just like the stepper motors on your 3D printer today or something like that, very, very similar. You see the, the wires here go to the controller. I've found, and I made videos about this, sometimes these get gummed up, a little bit of oil in the bearing can kind of rejuvenate them a little bit. It's not a good long-term solution. Theoretically, it'd be possible to replace the stepper if you could find like the exact model and you know, I don't know. I've never tried to do that kind of stuff. But the stepper ones seem to be a little bit less reliable than the later voice coil ones, which is the way modern hard drives work. And that means that it uses electromagnets inside with some neodymiums to position the head. It's much faster when using voice coils. It's much more precise. That's how modern hard drives work to this day. And it was around the 80s when hard drives started moving to voice coils over steppers. I can't say when it comes to these, these this age of drive, the steppers are worse than the voice coils. Probably because obviously there's more to fail in a stepper motor than a voice coil. A voice coil is electromagnets and then it has a bearing inside. So that bearing though is not heating up like the, the ones in here. Anyways, I don't know. And then of course we have the spindle, which turns the disc, which is this right here. And as I mentioned, this does appear to be working fine. I'm not gonna spin it too much while the drive is not powered up. So, all right, well, first thing we're gonna do is um, I'm gonna unplug the data cables here. So remember, they're away from the power connector. <laughs> I will purposely try to remember that. I just wanna power up this drive first on its own, because if this thing is not spinning, and we can't get it working, then obviously this video is over. So let's just plug this in right here to this ATX power supply. And um, here we go. Oh boy. That doesn't sound good. That is so loud. It's unbelievably loud. Now it is quieting down though. I'm just lifting it off the desk here. <laughs> Most hard drives, when you power them up, there is a controller of some kind on here just to kind of move the heads around a little bit. This one doesn't seem to do anything. I'm gonna power it off. Wow, that was loud. Now I'm wondering if it was loud just because the bearings are gummed up a little bit. Okay, here we go, let's try again. Okay, it is so much quieter this second time. So obviously the that spindle bearing was not happy and just running this did make it work a bit better. Is the light flashing on the front? No. Let's just power it off and on really quickly. I wanna see if that light comes on. Nothing. Sometimes you might get like a flashing error code, something like that. It could well be that this hard drive is the, I don't know how to say it, dumb. Like it doesn't do anything at all. It's like a floppy drive. It just spins up the spindle. There's a tachometer just to maintain the 3600 RPM that these typically run at, and that's it. It needs the controller plugged into it to actually do anything. But I'm not happy with the fact that, the... is it actually seeking there? Hmm, I thought I heard it make a clicky noise. It seems to be making a little bit of a noise. Like, a, like it's trying to seek. But the stepper definitely does not appear to be moving at all. I'm trying to find a tool here to try to turn that a little bit. So far, I'm unable to turn the stepper motor. Now, sometimes when it's energized, it's locked in place. I'm gonna cut the power and let this spin down. And while it, it does, I'm gonna try to turn this. Okay, there we go. I was able to move it. So let's see what happens now when I turn it on, if it actually moves. It moved freely. It didn't feel stuck. There we go, did you see that? It moved. <laughs> it went into the home position. I'm assuming that's the home position. All right, well, I guess this hard drive's kind of the dumb variety and it doesn't actually do any kind of seeking or anything when you turn it on, like no exercising of the heads. 
In addition, I don't think it's parking the head when you turn it off. That's something on early hard drives you had to do manually, and it wasn't something that the controller would do. A lot of times, the way it would work is the spinning disc would help generate a little bit of extra current that I guess got shunted into the stepper motor somehow, and it allowed it to step or step it into the park position as it was spinning down. And you would kind of hear it go, brrr, and you would hear this thing, and it would hit the bump stop, and then brrr, brrr. Anyways, this thing doesn't seem to be doing that. But the fact is it's spinning, and it moved the heads. So that's a good sign. I guess we need to reconnect this controller and see if this thing can work. All right, cables are connected. I'm going to connect this up to this machine. Now, it has a regular IDE controller, but the good thing is that these here are typically at an address that's different than these. So this is like 140 or 1F0. I can't remember. It's one of those two. This is probably going to be at something like 300, which means that the hard drive controller probably can coexist at the same time as the IDE controller, which means if this hard drive is reading, then we can use the compact flash card here to try to actually access the files. I'm gonna pull the card out though and allow it to just try to boot off this hard drive. You never know, it might actually freaking work. Let's see what happens. I'm just gonna prop this up as well so that you can see if the light is blinking. I know it's just right there. All righty, well, here we go. Let's let this all spin up. Oh, I'm in the wrong mode here. All right, well, right off the bat, we got disk boot failure. So it's almost like it didn't even try to boot. I would have thought it would have done something more than that. And it's literally doing nothing. Usually when you have a card like this that has its own BIOS, it's gonna sit there for a little while when you turn on the computer and it's gonna attempt to try to boot. Now. I got to take out this little card here. I have this card here, which is an XT IDE ROM. It's allow, it allows me to use a compact flash card with the IDE adapter. This could be conflicting with the ROM that's on the card. So I need to pull that out and try again. It's hard to know exactly with this controller card where the ROM is mapped into the memory map of the PC. It's going to be in the upper memory region and it may well be conflicting with this little card here. So we'll try this one more time. In fact, see how it's just sitting here doing nothing? I think it's the XT. I think I think it's this card here, the hard drive controller trying. Oh, the lights on. Oh, it's booting. It freaking worked. What? That's unbelievable. I am shocked that it freaking worked. Look at that. Wow, it's so noisy this drive. I am shocked that it worked. There it is. Uh, looks like we have what? I think the model number was 252 on this drive, so probably 50 megabytes unformatted. If we do check disk, if it's on here, it should tell us the capacity. Okay, actually, formatted capacity is 10 megabytes, so <laughs> it's smaller than I thought it was. We'll see if F disk is on here. Compact personal computer, so is that where this came out of, huh? List partitions, there it is. It says it's 304 cylinders. That can't be right. This drive has to be bigger than that. Hmm. Now the drive does make, the drive is making some kind of weird noises right now. Just sort of like a, I don't know how to describe it. Okay, well anyways, let's poke around the hard drive a little bit here. So we have a DOS utility. What version of DOS are you running? 3.1. Wow, okay. PC tools, this is like a utility program of some kind. I think it has like a shell of some kind, but it is reading off the, the hard drive. Look at that. It's so amazing, this thing even works at all. I had no idea. How old is this program, PC tools? Well, I did, I did about, and I was just looking for a version. Keystroke compatible. Okay, whatever. Uh, there's nothing special about this program. You can get that off WinWorld or whatever. Okay, we also have util directory here. Oops, util. Configure printer. Core test. Oh, interesting. I've seen this program before. So this will tell us how slow. Look at the transfer rate. 80K a second? <laughs> that is unbelievable how slow that is. Now, I don't think that's going to be the fault of this hard drive. It's probably more to do with the way it's formatted. There's an interleave setting you set up with these types of drives. If it's set wrong, your performance is dismal. And it usually has to do with like how fast your computer is and also 
the controller you're using, how fast that is, and along with the hard drive. Switching over to one of these 16-bit cards here like this, this is a high-performance card compared to that card that's on there. So if I plug the drive into this card and we reload level it, it's gonna be way faster. But yeah, 80K a second, average seek time 100 milliseconds. What, that is so slow. Uh, what else do we got in here? CT, cache test. What, 1991. That means someone was using this thing. Is this, it is writing to the hard drive right now. Uh, I'm just gonna abort out of this if I can. No, I cannot. Oh, there we go, break. I didn't see the dates. Uh, 88, 87, 90, 92? Oh, Microsoft Diagnostics on here? MSD, is that what this is? Yes, it is, version 2.0 from 1992. All right, what else do we have on here? Dev find. What is dev find? Oh, kind of interesting. So it just tries to identify the DOS driver uh, devices. So the printer, the console, LPT123, clock device. It's not particularly a super helpful program, to be honest. FF. Okay, it's doing some kind of a directory of the whole drive, I guess. F tree. Oh, just a directory tree. People would print these out just to kind of help them find stuff on their drive. FV, view directories. Okay, don't know what that's all about. Good look. I think this is a way to view programs maybe, or view uh, files, list. Oh, just, okay, a way to make a directory list. LS, is this like a DOS, or yeah, it's a Unix LS type program. Map mem. Ah, this is kind of showing you what's in memory. So command com and free memory, 601k, which, okay, there's no checked, there's no mem command. 601400, 601440 at the bottom there. Mark, marked current memory position. Interesting. MCP diag. Do you have a color display? Yes. Okay, we have a math code processor. Oh, it's just, <laughs> it's trying to do some diagnostics on the processor. I always thought these are silly because yeah, if the chip's not working, it's your computer's gonna crash. <laughs> so not not very useful. MM IBM. Hey. IBM PC Media Magician. So I guess this allows you to sector edit the hard drive. Interesting. Okay, yeah, look, zap a sector. Quit to DOS. P mode. Printer control, whatever. Okay, I don't that's boring. Printer, release, what's this do? Released memory from Mark. <laughs> okay. Status, PC Magazine System Checker Utility. So it shows you like your switch configuration for your IBM PC on the motherboard. <laughs> of course, there's no physical switches on this thing. It is a, uh, it's, it's an AT system, so it does not apply. Sys ID, what's this do? PCAT, BIOS Revision Zero. IBM compatible BIOS. Okay, yeah, it's just showing you stuff. Interrupts do not corrupt multi-prefix str string instructions. 8287 is present. DMA installed, PC Junior. <laughs> we have X dump. Extended memory dump. Okay. Okay, whatever. Trying to exit out of here. There we go, it was Q. And the last one is timer. No clock found. This is obviously for like an XT type clock. So that's it. That's it for this, this hard drive. Uh, we already saw this loading. There's a disk fix log. Disk fix log. Yeah, look at that. Surface scan was done. We don't have a date. It says 1980, so they obviously booted it uh, without that. PCT, oh, it's PC tools. Ah, that's it. The system is not a whole lot going on. All right, well, this drive is fully functional, which is kind of awesome. Now the thing is, its performance is terrible as we saw with this particular controller card. So I think what I'm gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna ax this 8-bit card here and we're gonna switch over to this 16-bit uh, card here that, we, that I was showing a moment ago. So I'm just gonna reuse the cables here. So we'll plug this into Winchester and we'll pop this card in here. Now this card occupies the exact same space as the original IDE card that's in here. So I can't leave this card in the machine at the same time because as I mentioned, IDE 
is the same as these controllers when it comes to their I.O. address, the interrupt, the commands, everything. And notice how there's really nothing on here. This chip is for the floppy controller. IDE really is just a couple logic chips because IDE is an extension of the ISA 16-bit bus over a ribbon cable. So yeah, I cannot keep this in there while this is in here. And that means I can either use an XT IDE type card to boot this system off of uh, the XT IDE, or I'm just gonna plug a floppy drive in here and I'm gonna boot up and we're gonna try to re-low level this drive. First thing we're gonna need to do though is look up the hard drive because we need to find out the size of the drive. And <laughs> it is a 10 meg hard drive. This thing is freaking early. So yeah, MFM SE506. Wow, unformatted is 13 megs. That's unbelievable. But I looked this up. We're gonna need to type these heads and cylinders into the BIOS on this computer. And there it is, 306. Uh, we have four heads. That means there's two platters in there with two heads each. And sectors per track is 17. All right, I can barely see the screen. I'm looking at like a tiny version of it because I'm sharing the desktop right now. So I can't, I can't look at the output of the computer here at the same time. So what do we have here? 306. Hard drive is making weird noises. I'm not sure about the longevity of this thing. Four heads, 17 sectors per track. Pre-comp is 128. And the landing zone, it says 305. Okay, I got that wrong. <laughs> I think people were probably screaming at the screen. Pre-comp, pre 128. Landing zone was 305 and the sectors was 17. There we go, 10 megabytes. And look at that. <laughs> I just accidentally typed type one and that's, uh, that's this drive right there. How funny. So BIOS type one, at least on the, what do we have an award BIOS here, is the freaking Tandon 205 or 252. Okay, cool. So we'll just uh, save this and it's gonna try to boot and it's not gonna work because like I said, we switched the controller, but maybe it will, let's see what happens. Let's just exit out of that. And I have a feeling we're gonna get nothing. We're getting nothing. Which is interesting because I would have assumed we'd have like the light on and it would just fail. But this could be because the low level format is just completely incompatible with that other card and this card. So I'm gonna hook the floppy drive up here and then we'll, we'll try to low level this thing. Oh, you know what? Let's go into the BIOS here. There may actually be a low level setting right in here. Uh, no, there isn't. Some older BIOSes do, like 286 motherboards. This has this auto detection stuff, which clearly doesn't work on, uh, on these older hard drives. So let's just set up this thing to 1.44 megs and we're gonna boot into DOS and we're gonna use some utilities to try to low level this drive. Okay, we booted back up again. I have the floppy drive connected and I have the boot disk that has Superstore in it or Speed Store. I always mix up which it is. Is it gonna boot? Mm, I think it's trying to boot off the hard drive still. It is set to boot sequence AC. I wonder what's going on here. So this is all correct, 10 megabytes. Hmm. Okay, so the drive seeked. Oh, it's working and I have it plugged into, oh, you can't see what I'm doing. There we go. So it's plugged into the MFM controller here, the 16-bit one. The light comes on. It's almost like it's trying to boot the hard drive, but for whatever reason, oh, I see what's happening, guys. Oh, I see what I did wrong. Okay, on the controller card here, I have the data cable plugged into drive two. Uh, oh no, drive zero is this one. I oh, don't forget it. Okay, I thought it was drive one and two. Drive zero is this one. Drive one is that one. Okay. Very interesting. I don't know what's happening here. So the light's on the hard drive right now, but then it doesn't come on any more after that. Like even when it goes to try to boot the system, the light doesn't come on. I know you can't see it. Oh, there it did come on. Oh, never mind. So why doesn't DOS boot? Hmm. I mean, that's just been sitting here for about a minute. We'll reboot and I'm gonna just take away the hard drive type here just to make sure that everything is booting properly without the hard drive. It's, it's sometimes you gotta do a bit of a sanity check with this because you can have all sorts of weird issues with the controller. There's some jumpers on this controller card 
that maybe are somehow preventing the system from booting. And maybe this disk doesn't work. Disk boot failure? Really? So there's something wrong with my disk. Let's try booting this other one here. I know this drive is good. Aha, that disk is bad. How freaking rude. Oh, you know what too? The write protect switch is not set. So I must have done something that got this disk erased. So this disk here does not have any way to, to low level the drive, I don't think, on it. It has spin right on here, but I don't have speed store. Let's switch over to this one that did not boot. So I think what was happening there when I had the hard drive site, uh, oh wow, yeah, this disk is, is dead. Okay, time for a jump cut because I'm gonna go and I'm gonna prepare this disk with speed store on it. That's where I need to low level this drive in DOS. Okay, I created a new disk that has speed store or super store, or whatever it's called on here, plus uh, the other utilities. So I think what was happening is that other disk wasn't bootable and it was trying to boot the hard drive, which is why it just sort of hung. So I'm gonna go back and set this to type one and we'll save all this. We'll stick the disk in the drive here. I'm gonna write protect it as well. Please do not erase the disk. I don't know, that was probably something I did. Occasionally I'll put disks at, or I'll erase them or I'll do whatever. And luckily I just keep an image of the disk. Um, oh yeah, look, it's booting. And that's with the hard drive set to type one. So that's exactly why it wasn't booting is uh, I guess there was no boot sector on that disk and it's just, it would try to read it and then it would go over to the hard drive and yep, there we go. Okay, so these are the utilities on here. This, in case you're wondering, that's just the auto exec bat. I just typed out what's on this disk. So let's run Superstore or Speed Store. <laughs> I, I messed up the name a million times. This was the utility I used to use back in the day when I was working in the computer store to low level format hard drives. There are probably plenty of other ones Speed store, that's the name of it. And here we go. So should do some stuff. There it is, type one. So we are going to re-low level the drive. So standard init, it will destroy data. Um, there's no defects that I know about, but that's fine. So we will just say no. Interleave, this matters from a performance perspective, but I don't know the correct interleave. I'm gonna assume because this is a 46 and this is a very fast 16-bit controller, that one-to-one -one is the correct speed. But if you have a slower computer or a slower controller, one-to-one -one can result in like 10K per second. And the correct setting, like say if it was two-to-one, you get 600K per second. Unfortunately, this program doesn't give you any kind of indication of what the correct interleave is. So there it goes. So it's interleaving, or it's interleaving. <laughs> it's low leveling. The light's on with the hard drive. You, I know you can't see that but it is, and um, yeah, it's doing its thing. So what we were seeing there when it tried to boot or access the hard drive, it just wasn't able to, that was absolutely a difference between the 8-bit card here, the one that was originally paired with this hard drive. The way this wrote to the drive is just different than the way this 16-bit controller did. From my recollection, 16-bit cards are interchangeable. So you could take this 16-bit card and another one, and they would both read the hard drive. It's the 8-bit cards where things are off the rails a little bit, and none of these cards seem to be compatible with each other. Why that is exactly, I couldn't tell you. There's probably some people who are far more expert about this stuff than me who could probably put comments down below about what exactly is the difference. But the fact is, it's going pretty quick here. After uh, it does a low level, which it will finish in just a moment here, it will do a quick verification. And if there are any bad sectors, then it should detect that. Here it goes, scanning the media. But what we're gonna do after this is we're gonna run SpinWrite 2, which is an, an old version of SpinWrite that's designed for MFM hard drives like this. And it will do a little performance check to tell us what the correct interleave is. And because it can read low level formats on the fly, as I mentioned earlier, you can actually change the interleaf. But I have a feeling we saw what that speed program, that little speed test program, was going that whopping like 80K a second. Um, look at that, initialization complete. So what you can do now is we can exit out of here. Now you can create your partitions directly in here, but we'll just quit out of this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run fdisk to actually partition the hard drive. So this is DOS 622 and it does work, but obviously you could use older ones. So we're gonna create a primary partition, maximum size, which, um, okay. 
That is the BIOS <laughs> telling me it's like a virus protection. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I'd never seen that. I need to turn that stupid feature off. I mean, it's good if you had a boot sector virus, uh, then that would warn you if something was trying to like <laughs> change the boot sector. So let's just reboot again. Now the drive should be format or partition. And now we just have to run the DOS format utility and you can then run SpinWrite. SpinWrite's a weird program. Has a bunch of recovery capabilities, but it only works if the drive is formatted already. So we're gonna format slash S. That's gonna copy the DOS 622 onto this drive. And then what we can do is once it's formatted, I'll just copy some of these files and stuff that are off this floppy disk onto the hard drive. I mean, this drive works. What's really curious is the stepper motor that's on the drive here is silent. Like it's obviously changing tracks and working, but you can't, I can't even hear the noise. The, the drive bearings are so loud. I mean, it, this audio for this recording is probably terrible because the, the, the hard drive noise is so loud. This is just how hard drives were back in the day and we are spoiled now. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh boy, that's annoying. Okay, there we go. Hopefully the drive is, so there's the drive. Let's copy a colon start out star to the hard drive here. Uh, we'll just overwrite everything, it's fine. I forgot what I was saying. Anyways, I, oh yeah, we're, we're spoiled with solid state drives and even hard drives that you do buy now, the bearings are so quiet. They're like that fluid type bearings that just barely make any noise. And you do hear the head seeking a little bit, but barely. Uh, this thing on the other hand, that spindle motor is unbelievable. So disc is out. Let's turn off that stupid virus protection thing. Virus warning, disabled. There we go. I don't know why I had that on. All right, so disk is out. This should boot off the hard drive now. And that is with the new controller here. And that means if I plug this old controller in, it will not work anymore. But let's just see. There we go. Sorry, MS-DOS. Look at that. <laughs> we are booted off the hard drive. Now, I don't have the utility for doing that benchmark again. Let me copy it onto this disk. Okay, it's on here now. It should be... Uh, okay, I thought I just copied it onto this disk. Oh, it's okay. I thought I copied it on the disk. Oh, I did. I'm looking at the C drive. There we go. Uh, it's HD speed. There we go. HD speed. I think that's pretty much the utility that we ran a second ago. Here it goes. How fast is this going to be now? Seek error. Okay, well, anyways, look at that data transfer rate, 411 kilobytes per second, and the seek time was 100 on the other card, and now it's 21. What a giant increase in speed. Why did it uh, give us that seek error? That's a bit weird. Maybe this drive's not working well. Could be that it's just not 100% compatible with um, the way this program works. Either way, 411K per second, and uh, 20 millisecond seek time is a massive improvement over what we were getting before. And I think that a lot of that has to do with the, the, the low level format interleave, but also like, it could have been wrong with this card, which could have resulted in that unbelievably bad performance. Now what we're gonna do is let's boot off this floppy and let's run the spin right utility, which will give this drive a nice thorough low level format, which is perfect because I wanna validate that the mechanics of this drive are working properly, like the stepper assembly plus the disk surface and SpinWrite is a great program for really exercising the mechanism of these old MFM hard drives. If you have old MFM hard drives that you're trying to keep alive, like, like I do, I really recommend SpinWrite 2 from Gibson Research specifically uh, for this thing. It wants me to push an arrow key. So we're gonna do SpinWrite analysis. Now this drive low level formatted correctly. Uh, yep, known incompatibilities. And so there are a lot of options in here. We're gonna do the full analysis, but we're just gonna do the quick low level, which really kind of will exercise the hard drive's mechanics and also do a really thorough surface scan. And then uh, we'll know if this drive is working well or not. But so far, so good. I'm frankly shocked. But then at the same time, I'm not. Tandon make, makes really good stuff. So right now it is, um, it is doing the complete seek back and forth. And I can see the stepper motor is like going to the full, full extent. 
and it is, it's a slow seek time. But what's quite amazing, as I said, it's silent. And most of the time, hard drives back in the day with the stepper motors did make quite a bit of noise with the seek. So yeah, that's, that's pretty curious. Sorry, it's a little blurry, but there, there you go. There it is, you see that? It's doing the seek. The clicking is coming out of the PC speaker, not out of the hard drive. So this is what I, uh, maybe I'll drop, I'll drop one drop of oil in there. So I got some bearing oil here. This is uh, stuff I use, I got it from the HVAC guys. Just gonna drop that in there. While it's going around like that, that should just sort of, maybe, Maybe it'll lubricate things, I don't know. I'm just gonna use a cotton swab here to, I spilled a little bit. <laughs> this takes a while. I'll probably do a jump cut at this point. Oh no, I'm gonna, I'll do a jump cut to the point where it shows the interleave speed stuff. That's what I wanted to really show how the wrong interleave results in a terrible, ter terrible performance of a drive. Now here's another data screen, just some interesting curiosity. Drive RPM is one less than 3600, it's kind of what I thought. And MFM encoding, and notice the controller BIOS location is F000, so that is because this is, uh, well, it's using an AT BIOS, which means that it is in the actual system BIOS. If we had this card in play, this program would work with it and it would have told us where this BIOS were located, so like C000 or D or whatever. And maximum data rate, 513, uh, thousand bits or bytes per second. So yeah, about 500 whatever K per second. So this is an interesting screen that I've actually never seen with Spinray. It's telling us that this controller responds with an error while oh, to low level formatting, which is weird because we just did a low level format and it works totally fine. It just means that I guess Spinray is not gonna be able to quite do everything it needs to do when it, to re low level the drive, but that's fine to be honest. We don't need to re low level, low level the drive. We just did that, but yeah, that's kind of an unusual error. So this is the pattern testing. This is where it does an extensive surface scan of the entire drive. I'm just gonna do the minimal one because the drive seems to verify fine and we did a DOS format fine, but I wanna really exercise the, the assembly. Uh, extreme will take like hours and might take a, an entire day to run. So I'm just gonna do the minimal one, which is relatively quick. Oh, so interesting. So because of that low level thing, it couldn't do it couldn't do the low level or the interleave screen I wanted to show, showing the different speeds depending on which interleave you have. Normally it does work. I don't know why it aired out, but definitely use this exact controller with this program on the interleave thing and it worked. So maybe it's whatever this drive is doing. But here it goes, it's actually doing the uh, surface scan. And it's going pretty quick actually. What this is gonna do is it's going to identify anything where it like, it, what it does is it's trying to read and write from every single sector on the disc. And if anything is like marginally bad, it's gonna identify that. And the more thorough you do it, the longer it spends on every single sector reading and writing. And it's just a really good way to, to ensure that you don't have slightly marginal sectors on the drive. But what's frankly amazing is as old as this drive is, it's, somehow has zero defects and is working perfectly, even though it has corrosion on it and it's that old, um, I guess we'll let this run and um, we'll be back. Well, the surface scan is still ongoing. I thought we'd take a moment to look at an old advertisement to see how much this drive cost. I wanted to kind of figure out when this drive was from. What we're looking at here is PC Magazine from December, 1985. And in the back pages or wherever we are here, well, page 80 or 90, it's not really the back pages, but there it is, Tandon TM-252, 85 millisecond average access time. And I can't quite make out the price, $520, is that what that says? Well, I don't know, it lists it twice. And I wonder if that's because you got a different controller if you were pairing it with an XT or an AT. Either way, uh, well, there were several of these available at the time. The Sugar Art 712, the Seagate ST212, and the Tandon, and then the Rodime. And then there was uh, 20 meg versions, and it looks like there was a TM, or I saw somewhere else, oh, I, I don't know where it was. Apparently there was a 262 version of this drive, which actually has 20 megabytes. So it probably has four platters inside, same physical characteristics otherwise, and this is the two platter version. So that just doubled the capacity, and you know, adds extra price. Uh, what is the seller here? Shop around, then call PC American and save. Oh yes. Where are these people based out of? 
Uh, it looks like Fountain Valley, California. Yeah, many, many PC importers back in the day were based in California. And that's really mainly because, I mean, not so much for like parts like these hard drives, but all those clone parts were coming from Asia and it was really easy to get them to California. There's some big ports and stuff there and it gets right off the ship. What are we looking at here? So we got multifunction adapters, monitors, there's the IBM PC monochrome adapter, 240 bucks. Wow, Hercules card was a bit more, but you actually got those graphics modes. And we have Hercules color card for $169. Wow, why was that cheaper? That's interesting. And monitors, high res color, M deck, 640 by 240. So this would be a CGA style monitor, 400 something dollars. And a Sony with a super fine pitch, expensive, but not that much more. And you got a really good monitor there. 1985, I don't think VGA was out yet or had just come out. So none of these, well, actually look at this N Amdex here, 480 lines. So that means VGA, I guess. Most things would be um, 350 lines, like this Princeton monitor, because uh, that would be EGA. But there were EGA cards in 85 that did actually support 480 lines. So they were like VGA style signals, but usually over TTL. I don't know if any of these are actually analog RGB. Taxan 440, 640, Amdeck. Yep, anyways, kind of interesting. Uh, do we have any like PC components? Oh yeah, here we go, PC systems. IBM PC, no drives, floppy drive, no drives. So it comes with a keyboard and a controller for 1,450 bucks or two disk drives, 1600, or a monochrome system. I'm assuming no monitor. This is like with the card installed. These prices, that was for the IBM PC 5150. 5160, which wasn't any faster, the XT here, was significantly more. Although I guess with a 10 meg hard drive, $2,300, but I don't know if that came with a video card. Color system and two floppies. Anyways, there's the AET, so 5170. Oh, the price, the price. Ouch, that's pricey. But you go into the clones here, the supercomputer, PC compatible, or XT compatible, uh, eight slots, one drive, two, six, eight, 700 bucks. Look how much cheaper that was. No wonder why no one was, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed anyone bought PCs. I assume it was a businesses, everything was just a business. Oh, hey, I just noticed it's done. So there it is, it's complete. Not a single bad sector. So even though it wasn't low leveling the format, it was reading and writing every single sector on the drive. And if we push the space bar, it actually read and wrote, wrote, wrote and read, <laughs> whatever, anyways. Bytes read and written, 127 megabytes on this 10 meg drive. So it does show you how like much it was exercising every single sector on here, 20,000 sectors and not a single bad sector. And we push this button here. This will tell us here if there's any defects and there were none. What a reliable hard drive this thing is. It's pretty warm to the touch, but that's okay because it freaking works. So if we exit out of here, uh, remember to park your heads. So park is on the disc here. If I type park, oh, that's noisy. I guess the drive heads are parked. And let's turn it off. Ah, oh, my ears, my ears. <laughs> yeah, these hard drives were just so loud. Well, there we go. I'm just gonna pull the cables off of this thing. Uh, what I need to do, I suppose, is well, I need to mark this drive as good, but I guess I should store it with these cables attached because they're non-standard. But this drive, I, I'm, I really didn't think that this drive was gonna work. So what I like to do when I have a drive like this that I've just done that process to, is I'm just gonna write 10 megabytes. And um, I wish I could switch to the camera to show you what I'm writing here. So 10 meg, type one, just to help me remember that that's, uh, what the type is, you know, when I go to set it up next time, I'm going to say works and I'll put a date. And today is uh, the 15th of March and uh, 2024. So I just write that on there. That way, I didn't write the five very well, did I? There we go. That way in the future, I will bust this drive out again, plug it in, you know, see if it boots. Um, Maybe I'll put AT over here, just, just to remind me that I use the uh, AT controller with this. And uh, yeah, what I do with my MFM hard drives is I typically, I keep all the ones that I have that still work, like this one. 
I don't know why I even keep these because they're so noisy. And it's not like I'm ever gonna use one of these in a, in a computer, but I suppose, I mean, there are the occasional computers that they require MFM hard drives. That's all they support. Like they don't, they don't support other types of, of drives. Like, you know, if it's a PC, it's no problem. You can just put an XT IDE in it. But if it's something that's non-PC, it doesn't always have some kind of a solid state option. So my only bet is to have some of these drives on hand that do work. Because these are so unreliable, I would never willingly put one of these in something, especially a PC. It's always a better alternative, like compact flashcards. But for the older systems, honestly, um, it's nice to have some of these on hand. So what I do is I periodically break them all out. I will boot them up. Uh, I always use the same gold controller to do the formatting. That way I don't have to worry about, you know, if I use something like this. So I, I'll plug them in, boot them up, see if they still boot, because I leave a DOS system on all of them. And then I'll run SpinWrite and I'll just do that analysis thing on it. And then basically if it goes bad, then it gets retired and I recycle it usually. Maybe I'll do an autopsy or whatever. And I have had drives die. Like I've had plenty of drives that were good and they work just like this. And then I'll break them out a year later and they don't work anymore. They just died on the shelf. And down here in the basement where it's climate controlled, it's always, you know, about 21 degrees Celsius, 70 degrees or so. Humidity is like 45% typically all year round down here. And the drives still will die. But that's what I do. Uh, we just went through the whole process with this drive and um, it's a survivor. At least this is from 1985 or earlier, and it freaking still works. I'm shocked and amazed. Whoops. I'm shocked and amazed and pretty happy. So yet another drive to add to the collection. And th there we go. So if you enjoyed this video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. If you didn't, you know what to do. Huge thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up over here somewhere. You can become a patron at the link in the description below. You get early access to videos, and my patrons make it possible for me to do this full time, so I owe them a huge debt of gratitude. Thank you very much to all my patrons for all the support. And subscribe, thumbs up, all the usual YouTube stuff, and that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe. I'll see you next time. Bye.